So it's great that you now could put a face and can see him live, keeping on teaching you. Um, and we'll have then an, a, a chat about things. So I'm gonna, the way I'm gonna organize this, we're gonna cover four topics roughly, roughly in 15-ish minutes. Uh, we're gonna talk a bit about the recession, what's going on in the world now, why it's such an exciting time to be a macroeconomist, but an anxious time to be a citizen, of course. Then we'll talk about government debt. Then we'll talk about inflation monetary policy. And then finally, we'll talk about just general career advice and uh, things of that type. So the way I'll organize this, I'm going to ask a couple of questions from Greg to get things started. If you want to have a question, raise your hand, and then I'll be calling on you after I ask two or three questions from Greg for us to keep on the topic. But keep in mind that these are the four topics so that you may want to wait. If you want to ask something about government debt, then wait for the second topic or about inflation for the third topic or about the recession, the first topic. Okay. So... Welcome, Greg. Thank you for being here. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, um, it's, it's great to be with some former students like you, Ricardo, and with a hundred or so grand students. Exactly. <laughs> um, great. So I thought we'd start talking about the recession, of course, which is, uh, or recession, just what's going on in the macroeconomy. Um, now, you're not a health specialist, um, by which I mean you don't know if the virus is going to disappear, mutate, if the vaccine is going to be effective or not. So let's start as good economists by making assumptions. So let's assume that the vaccine is here and that by the middle to the end of this year, say, um, we're all healthy and can all go out and travel and do things as we used to. If that is the case, do you think they will have a quick recovery in economic activity? Or are we going to have a very prolonged slump? And more important than a forecast, of course, is what do you think uh, are the main factors that would determine what the economy will look like in the next two or three years? Well, this is a completely unusual recession. The typical recession is an accident. So some shock hits the economy, we're kind of surprised, and policymakers are scrambling to try to put people back to work. And it's actually hard to do. Recessions are very, very persistent. They're, they're, it's, it's hard to have short-lived recessions. This one, this recession was a recession by design. The pandemic hit, and all of a sudden policymakers said, oh, you know, don't, don't, don't go on vacation, don't go to restaurants, stay at home. If you're not an essential worker, stay at home or go work virtually if you can. And so policymakers sort of designed a recession. And so I am hopeful that when the motives for this recession by design go away, that is when the, we all get vaccinated, um, then in some sense we can, we can, we can go back quickly. So, I'm, so I'm, I, I am sort of optimistic uh, for a quick, quick recovery. Um, on the other hand, I don't, I don't know to what extent this very long period, this, this has go, gone on longer than I expected. I don't know whether this sort of long downturn is gonna leave scars. Are, are certain businesses gonna go out of business and it's gonna take time for them to reestablish themselves. Um, I actually suspect that's not a big thing. There'll be certainly some restaurants that are going out of business, but restaurants is an industry that has lots of turnover anyway. Um, you know, the equipment, the, the staff can move from restaurant to restaurant. So I actually suspect that once we actually get healthy, the recovery can actually happen relatively quickly. You're muted. Yeah, yeah. Carlos. Given that, what do you think then of, so Joe Biden there in the US is trying to approve a budget with a very big fiscal stimulus. That's a big discussion also here in the UK and a little bit all over the world. Should we be then doing these big stimulus because the economy is going to be depressed or should we be scaling back on those and that the economy will recover by itself? What, again, how do you think from our students who are learning all about fiscal stimulus now, counter-cyclical policy, multipliers, it's a hard choice. How, how would, again, you be thinking about whether you'd be pushing for a high deficit now or not? Oh, well, I, I, I think he, he's absolutely right. President Biden is absolutely right that in the middle of a crisis is not the time to worry about the deficit. So I'm not particularly worried about the deficit at this moment. What I would think about is whether the money you're spending is uh, well-targeted. And let me sort of agree with Biden on some things and not agree with Biden on other things. What I agree with him on is I think more aid to the states makes sense. There's a lot of states, governments operate with fairly strict balanced budget requirements. And so I think it kind of makes sense to, to federalize some of some of the some of their spending, some of their debt, um, and then the Republicans are pushing back against that. And I just think Biden's right against that. Where I think Biden's wrong is I think he's pushing for these very large checks to go to everyone, 
almost everyone willy nilly it's phased out at very high incomes but there's a lot of people who haven't seen their incomes fall they, they have a job where they can work virtually they can be getting a check for you know 1400 2000 dollars and there's no particular reason they need to they have the same income they had before so you're spending, spending lots of money on people who don't particularly need it if you look at disposable income during this recession it's actually gone up because we have had so much stimulus that people are having 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 higher disposable income than we had before the downturn and if you look at their saving rather than sort of eating it into saving as a nation we're actually saving a lot because we're sending lots of money to people and people can't spend it and so we're, they're just accumulating lots of liquid assets which i think has something to do by the way with the booming stock market they're accumulating these liquid assets they have to put it somewhere banks are paying negative rates of return even if the stock market looks virtually valued, it still may be better than earning the, your, your minus 2% in the bank, real. Um, so, I, so I think once, so, so, I, so I don't think we need more st stimulus to people who don't need to be stimulated. Right. Um, oh, right, so let me ask another question. Oh no, actually let me call on Sania. Sania, Juneja, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, hi, um, good evening, sir. Uh, my question is about the vaccine rollout. There is this ongoing debate about the government paying the citizens to get vaccinated, given the amount of anti-vaxxers both here in the UK and the US. My question is, do you think such an economic incentive would be effective in countries where the government doesn't want to make vaccination compulsory? Yeah, I think it's actually a great idea. Actually, I wrote a New York Times column, I don't know, about a month or two ago, endorsing the idea of paying people to get vaccinated. Uh, the idea, I first heard it from an economist named Robert Lighton at Brookings. He proposed $1,000 a person in the United States. Um, I think I, actually that makes perfect sense. I'm, actually, I'm skeptical about vaccine mandates, a federal, like a government vaccine mandate. I can, certain employers, since it's a private institution, I think they can have vaccine mandates um, because you're not required to work for that employer. But I think the, for the government to have a vaccine mandate, to me, um, is not respectful enough of people's views in a pluralistic society. I, mean, I think the anti-vaxxers are basically nuts, by the way. So I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't agree with them at all, but I recognize that in a free society, people can, are allowed to have wrong opinions. Um, you know, here I'm going back to you know, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, sort of, sort of what I think of as the starting point for thinking about what a free society is like. So I think, I think if, if, you, if you really feel passionately that you don't want to get vaccinated, I think they knew we shouldn't force you to as a society, but we also need to find ways to nudge people into getting vaccinated. And I think the simple um, payment sort of fits into an economic principle. I think this is like a Pagovian subsidy. You know, I've, for years I've favored taxes on carbon to deal with climate change, right? It's an idea that goes back to Arthur Pagu, he taxed ex negative externality. Well, getting vaccinated is a positive externality, so let's subsidize the positive externality. So I actually think it's a, the Lighten idea is a great idea. Thousand dollars sounds in the United States and other developed world sounds about right to me, but who, who really knows? Um, I ha some behavioral economists, interestingly, have argued on the other side. They, they have argued that if you pay people, that's gonna make people think, oh, this, they're paying me to do this because it's really a bad idea. I really shouldn't. So people are afraid that that's gonna make them more skeptical of the government and vaccines if they start getting paid to do it. I'm not sure I, I'm not that much of a behavioralist. I think give people the right incentives, they'll, they'll, they'll do it. So I. I'm, um, so I, so I'm, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that. So continuing on liberty, Greg, since you were mentioning it, um, I mean, in the last six months, given the health emergency, we've had governments intervene, uh, not just on lots of restrictions on liberty, like you started in your question, but also all over in the economy. I mean, we've had payroll protection things, all kinds of different, here in the UK, we have the, what was it, help out to eat out or something where the government subsidizes to go out to lunch um, during the summer, but we've had a gigantic, not sure that was the best from an extra health externality perspective. <laughs> Seems all backwards, but anyway. But we've had a lot of these different interventions. And there's two perspectives here. And again, you've written a little bit about um, these issues of liberty and moral philosophy, if you want, which is one is, well, it's a war, it's an emergency, governments take over. Um, and there's another one that says, yes, but when this happens, then the invisible hand gets smaller and smaller every time because the state gets larger and larger and we won't get back. How do you think this will play out again? Or how do you think those trade-offs work in terms of when, when do we go from helping people to letting markets allocate resources again or not? And how to handle that transition? Yeah, I, I think that is one of the sort of the great questions of economics. And you know, I used to teach introductory microeconomics. 
I, I framed the whole course of like, when does do markets work well and when do markets not work well and if we need government to come in and correct things. Um, and, the, and I'm a big believer in sort of Adam Smith's invisible hand. And I, I, I don't view myself as a li exactly libertarian in the sense of Milton Friedman, but I do my, view myself as sort of a libertarian at the margin, meaning given where we are, a little more reliance on markets and freedom would be a good thing. On the other hand, I fully recognize that markets fail at times. And I think the most prevalent market failure is externalities that we do affect each, each other through a variety of side effects of our behavior. And um, I think in the middle of a pandemic, externalities loom large. So things like if I wear a mask, you know, going in public, that's affecting not only my health, it's affecting other people's health. And therefore, it's, I generally don't like to mandate what people wear or not. Um, so I wouldn't like regulate burkas or whatever you want this France tried to do. But, um, but in the case of, I think a mask mandate um, it might, may make perfect sense given the tremendous externalities in the midst of a pandemic. So I think you're absolutely right that in a pandemic, when externalities start, start looming larger, the government's gonna have to play a larger role than it normally does. One of the risks, which is more of a political economy risk than an economic risk, is that once government expands its role, people will say, aha, the government's bigger, let's leave it that way. And a lot of temporary government programs start end up becoming permanent government programs. So, you know, you know rent control in New York City was a, was a temporary measure during World War II during the housing crisis. Probably wasn't a great idea even then, but it was supposed to be temporary and it still exists today. So um, I think we have to be careful as we do expand the scope of government. We, we, we recognize we, we should expand it only for the course which it's called for. Okay, I'm gonna call on Kieran to ask a question. Um, yeah, so, um... Um, I've read some of your op-eds um, calling, um, um, uh, advising the Mitt Romney campaign on their fiscal stimulus um, on tax cuts. Um, I know, um, Professor Mankiw, you were a proponent for Bush tax cuts, and you are talking about the targeting of fiscal stimulus right now, about how the checks are not perfect in terms of the targeting. But many of the Democrats in the US are arguing that perhaps, you know, maybe expanding unemployment insurance or providing funding to states and local governments, etc., is better targeting than tax cuts, which are disproportionately on the very wealthy in terms of fiscal stimulus. So just wanted to know what your response was on that. Thank you for the talk, by the way, and for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for the question. I mean, so I think there's, there's a two sort of broad issues that you sort of raised. One is what sort of fiscal stimulus do you want in the short run to deal with a, a short run recession? So the sort of short run stabilization policy. Um, and, and there, I think you need to think about targeting. So for example, I actually think unemployment insurance is relatively well targeted. I think it's eight to the states and localities is relatively well targeted. I think checks to everybody is not particularly well targeted. And I actually think that it, the program that we have in the states called uh, PPP program was not particularly well targeted. In fact, the work of Raj Chetty has found that it costs a lot for jobs saved. To give, you one, to give you one example, I'm on the um, board of trustees of a, an independent school in the United States that got um, PPP money um, because it did qualify for it because it, the, the, the rules were that you have to basically show you're adversely affected. And of course, by the pandemic. And of course they were adversely affected. Lots of people were adversely affected by the pandemic, but they didn't really, if they didn't have, they hadn't gotten the PPP money, they probably would have, they wouldn't have really laid people off. They would have kept going. They would have even been down a little bit. Um, so it probably, didn't, it probably didn't save a whole lot of jobs, even though it certainly helped the school and the school was adversely affected. So they perfectly qualified they didn't break the rules at all. But um, it didn't really, in terms of job saving, it really didn't, didn't do much. Um, so I think, that we, I think we'll look back and we'll decide that some of these programs work better than others. And I, I have some, we're, you, have to, you have to sort of give uh, Congress a little bit of leeway because they're making these decisions very quickly. And so you'd be shocked if they didn't make some mistakes. So, but, but we economists, we can then look back and decide which were the right, which were the which mistakes. The second broad question issue you raise is not what do you, how do you think about the short run situation, but what do you think fundamentally about how big government should be and what the structure of the tax system should be? So that's like a long run question. I tend to, as I said, I'm a libertarian at the margin. I tend to believe in smaller government, 
But even putting the size of government aside, I tend to believe that a, a tax system that's more like a consumption tax, that taxes capital, capital income to margin less is, is more conducive to economic growth than, um, than, the, than the tax system we have in the United States now. So for example, I think Donald Trump was a god awful president, but I actually think he was right to cut the corporate income tax closer to what it has in much of, much of Europe. And, and even Joe Biden, has, who's, who's advocating a re- increasing the corporate income tax, is not planning to raise it back where it was. He's going to keep it at, tw- I think, 28 is the number he cited, which is seven percentage points below what it was when Donald Trump took office. So, so I think it's fundamental questions about the, 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 you know, what the nature of the tax system is going to be. I've actually thought for a long time, on taxes, by the way, that it'd be smart for the United States to have a value-added tax, like, like the UK and many European countries do, because, it's, because I think it's a relatively efficient way to raise revenue. So if you're going to have big government programs, you need efficient tax systems to raise the revenue. And a value-added tax seems like, to me, a relatively um, efficient way to do that. Great. By the way, on the beginning uh, for the students, an independent school in the U.S. is what in England or in the U.K. is called a public school, and in the rest of the world is called a private school. (laughs) (laughs) That translation. (laughs) Uh, Greg, uh, you just talked about tax system, which actually leads into a good question, which is in the last 10 years, you've also written quite a bit about inequality, as have many others, and so far as there had been a quite striking increase in income inequality in the U.S. as well as countries. Now, um, this recession has kind of turned all the inequality a little bit upside down insofar as disposable income inequality fell a lot for the reasons you just said. We just gave very big checks, especially to the poor people in society. At the same time, the stock market boomed, so wealth inequality got even bigger. At the same time, some sectors, people are doing fine in construction. People are doing great. Construction in the typical recession is the most affected sector. It's the one booming right now. It's completely upside down from the usual recession. On the other hand, usually males are the ones who lose more jobs in recessions. This is a very, people are even calling a she-male recession because it's dramatically affected females, both because of the school lockdowns and because they work more in services sectors. So... How do you, there's all these other dimensions of inequality all of a sudden. It's not just about rich and poor as it was six months ago. How would, given how much you've thought about the rich and poor inequality, should we tax the rich, should we not trade-offs? How do you, how do you start thinking about all these other shocks to inequality? Yeah, well, I think a lot of these, a lot of these uh, issues, you're probably not going to try to micromanage. And that is, as, as they go to the downturn, as we recover, there's a lot of inequality from groups and policy. Policies that we have are probably um, not sufficiently fine-tuned to, um, to to deal with actually every sort of inequality that arises. I've actually written recently, sort of favorably towards a universal basic income. Um, the, the, the candidate that's actually pushed this in the United States was Andrew Yang, who ran for the Democratic nomination, and he, he had an interesting proposal. He wanted to give everybody a thousand dollars a month as a universal basic income, and to finance that with a value-added tax. And actually, to me, that makes sense. It's a very efficient tax. The universality of $1,000 a month makes it very easy to administer. So, um, so I was actually quite sympathetic to the Yang proposal. Um, I know it's, con- it's controversial even among economists. So, I mean, but, but so I, understand, I understand that. But it's, I, I, it's had attract, it's a lot of attractive features to me. The other thing that's been talked about in the United States has been a wealth tax that Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren pushed. My sense is that the experience of that internationally is not great. Um, and so that's, I'm, I'm far less sympathetic to a wealth tax in terms of dealing with inequality. Let's say something right now about the cur- current rise in the stock market we've seen. I think the current rise in the stock market is largely being driven by ex- huge declines in real interest rates that's driving up stock prices. So that I think going forward, um, the expected return on financial assets is probably going to be lower because valuations are very high. So if you think about the wealth, not in terms of it's the stock of wealth, but how much consumption it can finance. It may not, I mean, the, the flow of consumption from your wealth may not have gone up very much. You, know, you have more wealth, but you're going to have a lower return going forward. So your sort of permanent income in some sense may not have changed as much as the stock valuation suggests. Super. Let me call on Lin Jun. You want to ask your question? Hi. Yeah. So I think my question is, we, so academic studies have shown that if you are graduating into a recession and you're looking for a job into a recession, your lifetime earning falls and your potential falls because of the dynamic nature of the job market. And 
we've also seen that with people who are very discontent about the economy and about their economic situation. That this has led to a lot of social and economic problems. And so I think my question is, are there any sort of well-targeted government policies or any sort of well-targeted policies that can address this problem? Or do we just have to give up on all the people who are basically just have bad luck? Well, that's a, that's a great and a very difficult question. It, it, you're absolutely right about the literature suggesting sort of lifetime adverse effects of graduating in bad times. I think that, I think that fits in with some of the macroeconomic literature that suggests that recessions are much more persistent than our standard models would suggest. Uh, that, that this, we don't, I don't think we fully understand why the scars of recessions are as lasting as they are, but they do seem to be. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. I think in terms of um, what tools we have, I mean, I was talking earlier about redistribution of tools, tax tools. That's dealing with sort of, that's dealing with, with incomes as if they are given, how can we redistribute them or wealth as they get, how can we redistribute it? Well, you, you really might worry more about is what's sometimes called pre-distribution, pre like how do we change people so that um, there, there's less, there's less uh, inequality in pre-tax incomes. Um, so that's really, that's not what the taxes, that's like before we get to the tax system, how do we increase inequality? I don't think there's a simple answer there, but my favorite book on that general topic is by two of my Harvard colleagues, uh, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. They wrote a great book called The Race Between Education and Technology. And they're basically stories that technology is always a force that tends to increase inequality because we invent technologies that are used by skilled workers and replace the unskilled workers. You know, think of the, I mean, think of something as simple as, as common as the ATM machine where you get your cash out. They replaced a whole swath of bank tellers but required a bunch of software engineers and electrical, electrical engineers to build them and maintain them. You know, or think of robots, you know, in, in car factories today, same thing. It requires sophisticated managers to operate the robots but then they're replacing a bunch of blue collar workers. So, so technology is gonna probably, it's, it's probably always gonna be that way. It's gonna tend to, um, benefit the more skilled rather than less skilled. What can we do as a society? We're probably not going to be able to change the nature of technological change. Something we're thinking about, but it's probably hard to do. What we can do is turn more unskilled workers into skilled workers. So I think the first task is really to think through the education system. How do we get more people through high school, and then more high school people into college, and more people at start college, graduating from college? Um, and th I, that's not an easy. That's easier said than done. But I think that's where a lot of our focus should be. I'm basically, I'm all for basically paying teachers more money, not just college teachers, even 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 like elementary and um, and, and high school teachers, in order to get better people teaching, have smaller class sizes, more tutoring, maybe having longer uh, academic years. So I actually think thinking about how we can improve the quality educational system uh, is is extremely important. Okay, let me ask. Uh, I'm, let me call on two people to ask questions, one after the other just in the interest of time. But I'm gonna ask first Rana, who's been waiting. Rana was a recent graduate. So unmute yourself, Rana, and ask your question. And then I'm gonna have Max, um, who had his hand up for next. And then Greg will collect the two. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, so my question uh, is with regards to the foreign programs that we're seeing in Europe uh, in 2020. Um, and we've seen that in the Great Recession, but not to the same extent. And my question is, uh, how would you investigate the kind of the efficient level of fiscal subsidies to, 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 these, to keep these connections between the employers and the I'm employees? I'm having trouble hearing you, Rana. I apologize. Did you start, was, was, was the general topic? I, I, I missed the beginning. Uh, so I'm asking about the uh, short, short time work and farming programs in Europe. Let me see. Um, if I get closer, do you hear me better? Yeah, it's a lot of static for some reason. I, I can hear you, but still, there's a lot of static. I apologize. Yeah. Um, so, okay, I'll try to be clear in my question then. Uh, so I was wondering, how would you investigate uh, the optimal level of fiscal subsidies? Uh, actually, let me check my audio and I'll, I'll let someone ask before me. And, okay, so, so can, fiscal can... subsidies. You're asking about fiscal subsidies, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you, uh, you no, Rana, just type your question quickly in the chat and then I'll okay. move on. Okay, so that's easier. All right, so let's get the Max uh, to ask his question. 
Sure, happy to. Uh, thank you for joining us, Professor. Yeah, the first paper I ever read of you was uh, through Timothy Pesley, our microeconomics professor, who put your defending the 1% paper on top of a reading list. Um, and so that's what I wanted to touch upon. Uh, you know, given the renewed discourse on meritocracy, and notably your Harvard colleague, Michael Sandel, has published this book, The Tyranny of Merit. I was wondering whether at all your view on uh, the moral implications of inequality and, and meritocracy has changed ever since. Well, that's a good question. I've, I haven't read Michael's new book yet. I've seen him give talks on it, and I, I know him quite well. I've been a guest in his class actually quite a few times. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my my motivation for writing that paper, depending the one percent, is this was the sense that in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the growth of what was then the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, there was the sense of a lot of people. And you still hear this from some politicians. The whole system is rigged that the, the rich get rich at the expense of everyone else and that they're taking advantage of other people. Um, and a lot of the focus on inequality was about the, the great unfairness of the top 1%. And th that was not my perception of how the world works. I think most people who get wealthy do things do so by creating great products to sell other people. That's, that's true in well-functioning in well economies. I won't say that's true in, let's say in, Soviet, in, in Russia. I won't say you get rich in Russia by Creating great products, you may do that by, by, by that system might be rigged. But I think in, in places like the UK and the US, I think people usually get rich by by producing great products. With you know, the, the Bill Gates uh, creating operating systems from a computer, or you know, Steve Jobs creating you know uh, uh, Windows, uh, and maybe the Apple the Apple iPhone, or Elon Musk creating a Tesla, which I understand is a great car, even though I don't have one. Um, so I think mo most people who get rich are just doing amazingly great things. Uh, for the economy. So I was trying to, I was trying to, that's why I wrote the paper called Defending the 1%. So when I think about inequality, I'm more, I'm, I'm less focused on the, the top 1%. I'm more focused on people at the bottom saying, how do we help people at the bottom 20% rise up the ladder, not how do we pull people at the top 1% down. Um, now, of course, there's people at the top 1% that don't fit in the category that I described. You know, there's Bernie Madoff who does get rich by stealing from other people. And those people are correct, correctly go to jail and they're caught. But I, I think as a group, I think the 1% was being unfairly demonized. I think what Michael Sandel raises is an interesting question of, okay, suppose you believe that Bill Gates got rich through merit and Steve Jobs got rich through merit and Steven Spielberg got rich or J.K. Rowling got rich all through merit. They did amazing things for the world. H how do we think about wh whether merit is something that we want to reward? And, and are we demeaning ourselves? Um, by rewarding merit and respecting merit so much. I think that's an interesting philosophical question. I don't really know the answer to that. That's also a different question that I was addressing, which is saying, look, I think most people get rich, do get rich through merit. Um, and I think once, once you realize that, you, real, you, you people are a little less offended by inequality. So, you know, at the same time we had Occupy Wall Street in the aftermath of the financial crisis, there wasn't Occupy Hollywood, right? There's a lot of rich people, rich people in Hollywood. People would say, let's, you know, why is Steven Spielberg getting so wealthy, making great movies? Or, there wasn't, um, occupied Major League Baseball, people were getting upset because be the best, these best hitters were getting millions of dollars a year. When people see that there's merit, when people see that people are doing great, getting rich by doing great things, I think generally, most people don't object. Um, but it does, it, I think, but I think Michael Sindel raises interesting questions of should, should, should we reward merit or should we try to r reduce the, the role of merit um, in, in society. And I don't know the answer to that. So that's a question probably best left for philosophers than for economists. Okay, so let me call now on Susanna first and Devaki after. Um, Thank Susanna, you. Um, so my question stems from a uh, historical macroeconomic perspective. Um, if we were to run simulations to anticipate uh, the long run growth trends or levels post COVID-19, which historical recessions or phenomena would you actually look at? And what would be the criteria to do that? Well, that's an interesting question. I, the, the, most of the recessions we've had um, recently are so completely unlike this. I'd, 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 I'd want to almost go back to 1917 when we had the last sort of major pandemic to see how we recovered from that. Um, I know there's been some, a little bit of work on that, um, I've not I've not worked on that topic. I've, I've seen some of it. Well, I think that would be an interesting 
example, but I mean, I think you really, you, you want to get something that's more similar to, um, to what we're experiencing. There's, a, there's an old uh, quotation from the economist, great economist Robert Lucas, who said, all recessions are alike. And I think one of the things we've learned is that it's completely not true, <laughs> that, 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 that this recession is very, very different from things that have come before. Um, and so I think it's very hard to draw historical parallels, but I think, I think probably 1917 is probably the best, the, the best thing I, I, I can think of. Okay, thank you. Okay, Devaki. You still there, Devaki, or no? Ah, you are. Oh, hello. Okay, I'm from India. Actually, my question is like, uh, uh, in countries like India, what are the challenges and how we can, you know, like uh, transform from developing to a developed nation, like problems and like how, like basic problems? Well, that's, I, you know, I wish I had a great answer. I'm not primarily a development economist. I know there are a lot of, a lot of great ones um, around the world and also the LSE. Um, you know, my, um, there's a famous quotation from Adam Smith uh, where he said, I'm going to paraphrasing Smith now, I'm like, it's exactly right. He says, uh, little is, is necessary to take a country from lowest barbarism to highest opulence, but peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. Um, and uh, I, I, I often think about that quote when I think of uh, the, the, the developing world, where in a lot of cases, they, they miss those three things. I mean, a lot of the developing world I mean, if you look at a lot of, a lot of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, you see civil wars, you see you know, strife, you, you see uh, rampant corruption. Um, so, but so I, mean, I, I think what Smith was uh, getting at was the first thing you need to do is sort of get, you need to remove all the impediments, almost political impediments to stop, to prevent economic development, which is whether it's, you know, the civil war or, or, or international wars. Uh, or, or, or rampant corruption, make sure you have a court system that protects property rights um, and, uh, and so on. So I think it's obviously job one for many developing countries, but then there's all sorts of uh, public infrastructure, public goods that need to be provided, whether it's sanitation, uh, you know, roads, uh, educational systems. Um, and I, I think, and so, so, it's, so it's not like the government just can simply say, oh, we're, we're not gonna stop, gonna stop causing trouble. The government has, needs, needs to do the right thing. The, as an economist, one of the frustrating things for me is when I look at the, the impediments to big macro development in a lot of countries, and you sort of trace where the source of the problem comes from, you get the sense in the end, the problem is not really an economic problem, but a political problem. And so in some sense, you gotta to turn to your colleagues in the political science department, away from the economics department, to try to figure out, okay, how are we gonna stop the civil war? How are we gonna stop the rise of corruption? Um, you know, how, how are we gonna make our democratic institutions work better? And it's not, it's not only a problem for developing countries. The last four years, our, my, the US democratic institutions haven't worked all that well. I'm hoping they're getting a little better now. Um, uh, but I think a lot, a lot of it, a, a lot of economics ends up becoming political, being, having to be rooted in good political science. And, though, and that field it has even fewer answers than we do as economists. Let me, let me ask myself a question. Uh, and moving us on then to the second part, we're already way behind, but that's totally fine on talking about some government debt and inflation and macro policy. I mean, you already said, Greg, that you think that this is not the time to worry about the deficit. We'll leave that till later. Um, but I wanted to ask you a two-pronged question, if you want. One is um, often, you know, the U.S. dominating these debates, this not worrying about the deficit then spreads all over the world. But of course, in many other places in the world, you do have to worry about deficits because public debt and financial crisis are very common events. And public debt is at historically high levels across advanced and emerging economies than it has been. Do you, so first prong of the question is, to, to what extent do you think that we will see a lot of sovereign debt crisis? Do you think that's a problem? Which countries you'd be more worried about? But second, and slightly more provocatively, I mean, in the, in the US though, um, there were some issues or difficulties that the treasury had in selling bonds back in June. Uh, so there were some cracks there. Uh, the interest rates on 10 year bonds have been going up for the last five months and up to 1% in spite of gigantic amounts of QE to bring them down. 
the dollar depreciated when it always appreciates in a crisis. That's kind of the hallmark of a safe currency. The dollar has actually depreciated quite significantly in the last four or five months. Do you think there's starting to be cracks due to um, risky fiscal policy that maybe in the US one has to start worrying about deficits in not so long and worrying about deficits in the sense of sovereign debt or no? Yeah, I don't think we have to do it right now, but I do think we do need to worry about it, which is one of the reasons I'm not I'm not as enamored of this huge fiscal package that President Biden is proposing. So I think we will need to worry about it. I mean, if you look at the US situation, debt to GDP ratio is very, very high. That service is not very high because interest rates are so low. So it's not like debt service is, a particular, is particularly a challenge. And it's not quite clear what the right ratio to look at in terms of evaluating that debt situation is. Historically, the bond investors have always trusted the US debt because, I mean, I think it was Winston Churchill who once said, um, you know, Americans can always be counted to do the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives. So the sense is that eventually, you know, whatever our debt is, Congress will eventually exhaust the alternatives and then do the right thing and, and repay it. On the other hand, it's not like the forces that govern debt dynamics in other countries don't apply to the United States. We're not, we're, we're not, that, we're not that special a country, even though we've historically been a very prosperous one. So I, I think we do need to worry about the debt at some point, despite um, uh, low interest rates right now. Um, I don't know when that point is. I don't, I don't think anybody knows exactly what is the level of debt at which all of a sudden all hell is gonna break loose. But there, I'm sure there is such a point. Um, and I don't think we're probably close to it yet, but I think it's something we need to be mindful of, not now particularly, but you know, over the next few years as more of my generation, I'm, the, I'm a baby boomer, as my generation retires, starts collecting Social Security and Medicaid care, um, we're going to push up federal spending automatically. And so um, something's going to need to happen in order to sort of stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. Okay, let me ask then uh, Rana's question, and then I'll also call uh, <coughs> Ditya to ask. But Rana, what she was asking was, I mean, this, was, this happened most on this side of the Atlantic, which was the governments had these very large programs to prevent layoffs, where they would essentially subsidize, uh, well, they would pay, they would pick up the, the wage bill of firms just so that they would not <coughs> fire workers. And Rana was worried about how to think about trade-offs, because on the one hand, you're potentially reducing uh, foregone GDP in the recovery because firms won't have to find workers again. On the other hand, you're going to have potentially the shock requiring reallocation across sectors. And so what she was just asking if this recession seems different and this policy seems different, how would you think about the trade-off? How do you think about those policies as opposed to uh, like- well, we, we did something, yeah, we did something our PPP program was sort of similarly motivated, of, of giving money to firms in order to maintain employment. Um, I, I was personally skeptical of what's going on both sides of the Atlantic of shoveling money at firms. I had much, I'd much rather try to help the individuals who are struggling. Um, and to me, giving money to the firm to keep the person employed if that's not really needed isn't, isn't, isn't obviously better than simply um, saying the person's gonna get laid off temporarily and we'll send the money directly to the individual for unemployment insurance, say. Now the argument, people, the argument people make is, oh, you wanna maintain the connection between the firm and the worker so that they can, the firm can get going again, even after when the pandemic recession is over. The reason that never struck me as that compelling is it's not as if the firm, the worker is going to is going to disappear. I mean, the, the, the worker still is going to have a telephone and an email address, and the firm can call, can always call them up and say, "Hey, we're, we're starting up again. Why don't you come back to work?" So, to, to me, you didn't have to keep the firm on the payroll simply to maintain that uh, that, that, that form of uh, firm specific uh, human capital. So, I I, 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 I didn't I. I I thought it wasn't necessary to go through the firm. And I know I don't know as much about the European case. I know in the US case, a lot of money went to lots of people who didn't need it. And uh, whereas if you target individuals, I think is much easier. Actually, I had a particular plan. Let me advertise it. I had a particular plan I posted on my blog that I advertised. What I said was we should give everybody big checks, $2,000 a month, I think I proposed. Just huge, very expensive. But I said, whether that's a, that $2,000 a month is a loan or a grant, is it going to depend on whether your income falls? So if you get two thousand dollars a month and your income doesn't fall at all, like like my income, when does that fall off? Still teaching classes via Zoom. So if your income doesn't fall at all during this pandemic, that two thousand dollars a month was just a, a loan, and then you pay it back over the next few years 
when you income taxes come due. For people's income falls, then that would be considered, we turn that into a grant and you can have some sliding formula. People's income fell by only a little bit. So I think, I think to me that would have, well, I call that ex post targeting because we don't really know who's going to need the money ex ante. Let's give everybody money now and then we'll, we'll target ex post when we see who's actually been suffering through this, because of this crisis. Um, that, was my, that was my proposal, but it, anyway, it was, it, was, it, was, it was one random economist's ideas of how we should best deal with these, these challenges. I mean, taxation is like an equity claim on my income. And so what you're saying is let's issue a convertible bond. <laughs> yeah, bond. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, Aditya, your question. Uh, I'd like to ask what your view on Biden's climate plan is and the Paris Agreement and also uh, Biden's decision to like stop the Keystone pipeline and obviously the job losses from that. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've been, as, as, you, as you may know, I've been a big advocate of, of, deal, of, climate, of doing climate change for a long, long time. Um, I, I mean, I'm a big believer in Pagovian taxes. And you know, when I first started thinking about Pagovian taxes, I, the, the externality that was first in my mind was actually congestion, because I don't know if you, I'm sure it's in London too. I know you may have solved a little bit with your, some of your pricing formulas, but you know, congestion in major cities is terrible. The best way to deal with congestion is to tax driving. Um, and so I've always been a big advocate of sort of taxing gasoline and other ways of, and toll roads and so on uh, to deal with the, that congestion externality. And then of course, climate change is a very similar kind of externality. It's an externality associated with carbon emissions, which is also fossil fuels and driving and other, but another, also other uses of fossil fuels. So I've been a big advocate for carbon taxes for a long time. Um, I, I talked to people who work for President Trump and apparently President Trump just thought climate change was a hoax, which as far as I can tell is a completely absurd idea. I mean, I'm not a sci scientist, but I talked to a scientist and I'm pretty sure it's not a hoax. Um, so he just didn't want to deal with it at all. So I'm actually very happy that you have a president who actually believes in, in climate change. I think the Paris Accord, getting with Paris was, was a, is a good thing. I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think it's really, it's more aspirational than as a policy. I think what we really need is a carbonized uh, carbon tax across many countries. And I'm hopeful that we eventually move uh, on that direction. Oh, and oh, you said the Keystone Pipeline. I don't know enough about the Keystone Pipeline to have an opinion. I think it's probably bad policy to have one administration say, no, you don't, can't build it. The next administration say, yes, you can build it. And the, the next administration says, no, you can't. It seems like a bad way to run a regulatory state to have regulations sort of go back and forth depending on what a particular electoral outcome is. So I don't actually know what the right answer is, but I just feel like the, we've ended up in a situation now that just creates a tremendous amount of policy uncertainty that makes it very hard for any investors to, 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 make, to make rational decisions. Okay, let me ask the next question, then just moving on to our next topic of inflation, uh, but I'll keep on calling on people. So Greg, so the students have been learning, we've been teaching them how central banks set interest rates, they raise and lower them to quench animal spirits if needed, according to a Taylor principle. But then right now, and finally, how they can complement that with quantitative easing or for guidance to affect long-term interest rates and try to achieve similar by going longer, if you want, on the yield curve. But now, right now, looking forward, I'm getting a little uneasy of teaching this to students, and I just did it, we just spent the last week doing this, because on the one hand, short-term interest rates can't go much lower than what they are now. And the Fed has pretty much committed not to lower that, but to keep them constant for a while. Um, Long-term interest rates are also really low. There's only so much QB you can do. And on the other direction, and so lowering rates seems unlikely. On the other direction, raising rates, given that you yourself just 20 minutes ago said, well, the debt service is really low. Yes, well, interest rates are low. If, if the Fed raised interest rates, then the debt service would be really bad. So you kind of start questioning whether the Fed is really independent to not raise interest rates quickly. But then if interest rates are neither going to rise nor fall in the next three, four years, what's pinning down inflation? Why is this not indeterminacy land? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the last part of the chain of logic they didn't completely go through, you know, the interest rate targeting and quantitative easing affects economic activity, which in turn affects inflation through something like a Phillips curve. And the problem is the Phillips curve is, hasn't worked all that well. As, and so we're kind of wondering you know, what, what's our theory of inflation? And, and the explanation we, we give these days is, oh, inflation, the Fed's been so credible that inflation expectations are really well anchored. And when inflation expectations are well anchored, then inflation's not gonna deviate much from the target. I mean, that's 
well, all that kind of makes sense. So the question is, how do you know how well, how long they'll re remain anchored? Um, you know, ships slip their anchor sometimes, <laughs> and the question is whether whether uh, the, 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 the ship called the economy is going to uh, slip its anchor uh, at two percent inflation. If you know, as I mentioned earlier, we're pumping lots of money in um, in terms of fiscal stimulus. That's showing up a lot in terms of sa personal saving rates. It's also showing up a lot in terms of the monetary aggregates, like M1 and M2. And so as, as we're released from our houses, and we're told you're, you're vaccinated, you go, out, go, and go forth and spend, people might look at their ba bank balances. I haven't gone to a restaurant in a year. I'm going to go out to a restaurant. I'm going to take that vacation. Um, I'm going to buy that car. And, and maybe, if, maybe if some of those businesses are struggling, maybe there'll be supply interruptions because those little cars won't be, all won't be produced quite as fast and maybe prices will start rising and maybe um, inflation will start rising. And if inflation starts rising, does that, that unanchor expectations? People say, oh, we're now moved into a 3% inflation regime or a 4% inflation regime, not a 2% inflation regime. The right solution, the policy solution to that would be then, then the Fed would raise interest rates. But that gets back to your fiscal question, fiscal observation, Ricardo, which is that, yeah, the, the Congress is counting on low interest rates to keep the debt service low. Are they gonna put pressure on the Fed to keep interest rates low as the Fed starts thinking about inflation? And that's the, that's the inflation scenario that you really worry about, which is that people start spending, inflation starts creeping up, and then there's some sort of political dynamic that makes it hard for the Fed to respond as they should under a Taylor rule. Um, and raise interest rates sufficiently. So I think there is that inflation risk. When the pandemic started, I remember I was, I'm an advisor to CBO and I was asking what they thought about this. And they said, oh, we, you know, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we think this, this, uh, this pandemic is deflationary, not inflationary. And that was the market's expectation too. If you look at the break-even inflation in back, back in March, April, break-even inflation had really fallen off. It was basically at zero in March, April. Now it's come back. Now it's a little above, I just checked this just before getting on this call. The, the, break, the five year break even inflation is a little above two now, it's above target. Yeah. Um, and so the question is whether that's, oh, oh, is that a trend or not? Are we gonna stay, so we stabilize it 2.2 .2, or are we gonna keep heading up to three? I don't know. That's, that, that, that's one of the big unknowns going forward. I, I don't think it's, uh, there are comments out there who are really worried about inflation. I'm not as worried, but I don't think their concerns are, are groundless. Okay, let me ask uh, David, David Zhu. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Professor. Thank you for coming. And um, it's actually built up onto the, your discussion about quantitative easings. My question is: so basically, when do you think should be the right time for Fed and also for other countries, EU, to start an exit towards the uh, exit out of the current QE and low interest? Like, what stage of the economy recovery should they start to actually exit? And for this time. How long should it take to actually exit the QE? And also, do you think, like, um, for example, stock market will be a concern when they are um, when they are making decision regarding exiting the QE and exiting current low interest rate regime? Because, like, I feel like current stock markets are rallying at a point which is already kind of like turns totally like unrelated to the fundamentals and on a rather crazy run, built sort of like on the promise that the QE is unlimited and can run as long as it goes? I, 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 that's, a great, that's a great question. I'll, 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 I'll um, disagree with a little part of the premise, which is the stock market's unrelated to fundamentals. I think if you take into account that, that, that real interest rates now are very, very low, then stock market valuations don't look quite as crazy as they would have historically, if you assume a, say, a constant discount rate. So, but I think if you, so I, I'm not, I, I'm not sure, I mean, the market's probably a little, over, the US market is a little overvalued. I'm not even sure European markets are overvalued at all. Um, but, I th but I think you have to keep in mind that high, high PE ratios kind of go hand in hand with, with very low real interest rates. That kind of, and, that, and that's true even in, in, in a rational world. I don't think there's any, I think they will eventually exit QE. I don't think there's any particular hurry to do it. I don't think there's any particularly problem with a, the, the central bank holding a lots of these long-term long-term securities. Um, I mean, right now we live in a very a situation now where the banks are holding tremendous amount of excess reserves that, that the Fed can raise interest rates on as they as they see fit. So, I, so we live in a sort of very different monetary regime. But I'm not sure it's necessarily a worse monetary regime than existed prior to all this quantitative easing. 
I should know, by the way, I, 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 I still am sort of um, agnostic about how, how useful quantitative easing is. I, I had somebody who was serving the literature on the, on the economic impact of quantitative easing. And he said that it seems like all the papers coming out of the Federal Reserve System are much more positive about its impact than people that think the papers outside the Federal Reserve System. And I think that's kind of right. I think there's a disagreement. I think that the Fed tends to be a cheerleader for their own policy uh, uh, interventions. Um, I think it's probably, the, I think it's the right thing to do and Ben Bernanke introduced it and so, and then the and successors continued it. Um, but I'm, I, I, I remain a little open-minded as to exactly how powerful, powerful a tool it is. Let me ask a related question. So this is um, as much as a question as a request for advice, if you want, or let me say something slightly crazy and then, um, <laughs> and then see how you react. So you've written a little bit about modern monetary theory recently, Greg, and students often ask about that. And so, I've been, I've drafted these set of tweets and I've had them on save for three weeks because I was so afraid of posting them. And so let me tell you what's in them. And then you'll tell me whether you should, instead of telling me if you agree or not, you'll tell me whether I should post them or not. Which is, I remember back to when I learned from you about supply side economists in the early 1980s. They started from a useful observation and correct observation that taxes, the impact of taxes on, on the tax revenues is not one-to-one -one because the tax base shrinks. Um, and they start also from some, um, some sensible accounting issues about how the government collects taxes and how to distort things. And then they went all the way to a completely extreme conclusion of, therefore, all tax cuts pay for themselves. If you think about MMT in the last couple of years, this modern monetary theory thing, it starts from a pretty sensible observation that central banks buy a lot of the government debt and they issue reserves to the banks, and that's another form of borrowing, and it's okay. They start with some accounting relations, as you exposited in your uh, in your article in IMT a few years ago, and then they jump to the completely crazy conclusion that therefore all government debt is you can borrow as much as you can without absolutely any limit and spend as much as you can. So twenty or so years ago, you got into a little bit of trouble when you des the described the supply side economists, if I remember, charlatans and cranks. And yeah. I remember you once telling me that you regretted writing that because that was far too much. Are MMTers the new Charles and Cranks from the other side of the political spectrum, or would you be more generous? Well, I, I, as as I've gotten older, I try to be more generous with everyone. <laughs> I, I I I yeah, I do think that the MMT discussion has not been a terribly useful contribution to the macroeconomic debate. I, I wrote a small article in the papers and proceedings a few years ago because I was asked to write it. By the an organizer saying there's a lot of discussion of MMT. Um, Bernie Sanders looked like he might be the nominee at that point. He's getting a lot of advice from the of, uh, from the MMT crowd, and so can you make sense of it? And completely coincidentally, a new textbook from some MMT people had been coming came out to so go. Okay, this is an opportunity for me to try to understand, and so what this MMT stuff is about. So I, I spent the summer reading their textbook, and basically wrote so it wasn't exactly a review, but sort of my summary of what what I thought I was getting out of it. Um, and, uh, and why I didn't buy it, and that was sort of that, that was the that, that article. I will I will warn you that my experience in, in writing about MMT is as soon as I did so, all the advocates of MMT say, you know, you don't understand what we're saying. Even though I really tried very hard to understand, and maybe I don't understand. Maybe they're right. Maybe I don't understand what they're saying, but I tried my best to understand what they're saying. And I've talked to other sort of mainstream economists, um, like 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 you know, Ricardo, who have tried to write things about MMT, and they get the same reaction, which is. You don't understand what we're saying, so I, I, you, I don't. I don't I'm not going to advise you whether or not re release your tweets. So I predict when you, do, if you do so, you will get the response from the MMT crowd that you don't understand what we're saying. Um, it's it's kind of a weird set of theories in the sense that it, it's not. It's something that sort of came up. It, it developed in some sort of small corners of academia, so sort of relatively small set of. And I don't. I'm, I'm not going to. It's probably going to sound more pejorative than I mean it to be. Sort of not major academic institutions, few people, sort of sort of second tier institutions. And then it sort of burst into the scene because for some reason these people got to be advising Bernie Sanders and a few other prominent left of center politicians. It's not like conferences that you and I go to on monetary economics, MMT features prominently, but it's not even there, it's not even discussed. But in that is, but it's very similar to supply side economics, right? It was that's very, exactly, exactly. It's exactly the same phenomenon on the yes, other side. That's right. That's right. It's sort of it's a few it's a few people who somehow go directly from some ideas in their offices to talking to prominent politicians, 
Um, that's, and that's not really good. That's not the way good economics tends to work. It tends to be debated in conferences first. Um, it tends, it, 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 and it, it, so, you, so you have a lot of professional vetting. Um, so, you know, so, so my view is that if, if MMT is constantly being misunderstood by mainstream economists, I don't think it's all mainstream economists' fault that they, maybe they haven't done a good enough job at explaining and sort of developing a common language with sort of main, mainstream economists. So I actually, I, 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 I wrestled the question, by the way, as, as, from a pedagogical standpoint, is it useful to teach, to talk about this in the classroom if it's not, if it, if it's not really a mainstream view? I tend to focus most of my lectures on what, is, what do mainstream economists think and why do they think it and not rebutting um, idiosyncratic views around the profession. Okay, let me ask um, Dan Mikhailov to ask a very short question because we're kind of out of time. Um, if you can, Dan. All right, thank you very much, Professor Mankiw. As a fellow Republican turned independent who was concerned by the previous administration's policy in China, I was wondering how our current spending spree would militate against uh, the, tr China, the trade deficit in the Sino-American trade relations and, the tra and our economic relations with China at large. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think tr in terms of trade deficits, I think the most important thing to understand is it's really about savings and investment a nation's overall trade deficit. And therefore, um, we really, when we think about trade deficits in the United States, we should think about our imbalance between saving and investment, how to remedy that. It's not, and I think bilateral trade deficits with particular countries are almost meaningless. I understand why politicians like it because international relations are country to country, but from an economic standpoint, bilateral deficits really aren't that meaningful. Um, in terms of sort of our trade relationship with China, I, I think, the Trump administration probably had a little bit of validity in saying that you know we, we, need, we need to be tougher with China about some things, in particular intellectual property, which I think is a particularly important issue for, for the West and, and China hasn't been very good at protecting. So I think there was a there was a kernel of truth at the center of the Trump trade policy, then surrounded by a lot of BS, and the BS was basically lashing out at everybody saying things didn't make sense, like talking about bilateral trade deficits, lashing out not only at China, but at all our, 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 our allies like Western Europe and Canada, Mexico, which we had actually pretty good trade relationships with. Um, and so I, I think the, 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 the kernel of truth in the, what the Trump was trying to do was I think lost among the, the, um, the, sur the surrounding BS. So I think it's, it was basically bad. I'm actually hopeful, for example, I don't know if the Biden administration is gonna do this, but I hope they can actually revive the Trans-Pacific Partnership in some way, um, because I thought that was actually a step in the right direction. I'm actually, I'm, I mean, I know that the Trump fr f fans would tell us that I'm, I'm, I'm your typical globalist, which is true. Like a lot, like a lot of economics professors actually believe in pretty much glo open global markets. Um, uh, and I'm a little nervous that the Biden administration doesn't. I don't know if you see, see this, but the Biden administration has actually signed some Buy America, uh, uh, I guess executive orders, I guess they are, that basically makes it more difficult for governments to buy, to, to buy things from foreign firms. That's probably a, a, um, a step in the a wrong direction. I mean, right, right now, the populists in both the right and the left are, are, are very ascendant in US politics and the populists of both the right and the left all hate international trade. And I, and, and I think the people in the center and so the left center right tend to be free traders. And I think we're, we're we are, um, Losing, losing that debate at this particular moment in history. Good, we're three minutes over time. I was gonna put just the last question to Greg, but which is welcome to actually use to answer or to just say some parting words since we're three minutes over. And that is because in the last, uh, wow, now a couple of decades, you've really been uh, putting a huge amount of effort into writing textbooks, uh, thinking hard about what is it that we know and we don't know, <laughs> what should go in the textbooks or not. Um, I kind of wanted to ask you a question, which I thought would be inspiring for the students of the last question of, you know, in your book, you talk about, for instance, in the principles work, you talk about here are the 10 big things that economists really know, and we're pretty kind of sure about this, even though there's always debates and, and, and things of that type. And likewise, your chapters try to capture in the different books of what is it that we know? What is the thing that you always feel when you write one of the chapters of the principles or the intermediate book that you feel like, I wish we just knew more about this topic? Um, what is the one that you think we have more open questions that you wish, like you wish you could give a principle here, but you just don't think 
our knowledge of economics has really gotten there yet? Well, I, I think the broad area of macroeconomics is, I think, underdeveloped compared to macroeconomic, microeconomics. So when I, when I was a student, when I was an undergraduate, I liked micro much better than macro. I took my first economics course. Micro made a lot of sense to me. It was like clean, it was well-developed, it was logical, and the macro seemed like a mess. And um, I remember really not liking principles of macro very much. And so it's kind of ironic that I ended up becoming a macroeconomist. Uh, and I think and the reason is that as I transitioned from just being a student, an absorber of knowledge, to moving towards being a researcher, a producer of knowledge, I realized that um, when you're doing research, you're not looking for really, the really good answers, you're looking for the really good questions. And I, always, I've, I decided at some point that micro has much better answers, but macro has much better questions. Uh, so I decided to basically become a macroeconomist and work on the areas where I think we don't know the answers. Because I think we don't know the answers is, is, is often the most interesting time, place to, to spend your time thinking. So, you know, I did a lot of work on trying to figure out well, why do, don't prices adjust quickly in the short run? Why are the sticky prices? That seemed like a big puzzle to me. It's still a bit of a puzzle to me, actually. Um, why, why, are, why are prices sticky? We know, we know I've done some work on that in our sticky information stuff. Um, but lately, I've been puzzling, as you, as you have too, about low interest rates and what does that mean for fiscal policy. In fact, I'm, Larry Ball and I are writing a paper, which I'll send to you, Ricardo, over the next couple of weeks on this topic. So, um, so I think macro, I think macro is, is, is the most frustrating as a, for a student because the, some of the, there's so many things we don't know, but that's why it's so exciting to do research in it because the questions are so important for people's lives and, so, and they're so intellectually challenging that it, 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 it's hard um, not to keep thinking about them. What a great way to end, especially <laughs> given that I'm your macro teacher of many of the students. Very good. Thank you so much, Claire, for your time and staying six minutes over. I think people had a great time, all 150 of you who have logged in. And uh, so let me pass it back to Sarah to speak from uh, the Sand Club. Okay. Um, I guess this brings us to the end of our talk today. Um, thank you so much, Professor Mankyu and Professor Yis for joining us today. We truly enjoyed it. And thank you every, very much, everyone, for coming and for your um, great questions. So yeah, um, have a good evening mor or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Next Tuesday, Sand Club Talk, we will have Professor Guido Tabellini from Bocconi University on Is Europe an Optimal Political Area? I will put the registration link in the chat. Please also follow us on Facebook for weekly updates, um, which Carl will do the link. Um, so we have a Zoom social till 8 p.m. UK time. Everyone is welcome to stay, have a chat with each other. It's our little Sankop session. So late president and deputy of Sankop and myself will be staying here for a bit longer. Um, so yeah, thank you so much again for joining us, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for organizing. I can't say for the social because I have children waiting for dinner, which I have to go cook. <laughs> but uh, thanks, Greg, again for coming. Thanks, Ricardo. See you soon. Who's <laughs> it?